I cried because it got me because of all we went through, but it's hard to have love for her when she had very little for me because I was unloved. And you're the oldest of, Three. you have a brother mm -hmm. and a sister? Mm -hmm. She's not with us anymore. Oh, I'm Lost sorry. Lost her to breast cancer, but anyway, okay, yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But my brother lives in Chicago and is a big restaurateur in Chicago. And he, he won in this because we were, the two of us were forced to work in the little hole in the wall barbecue restaurant and I despised it and my brother literally, so to speak, ate it up. We're, Your brother is Rick Bayless, just Rick. to be clear, because a lot yes. of people are so surprised when they hear <laughs> that you're yeah. brothers. Okay. Um, we were never close because I love sports and he did not, so we had zero in common, but he went that direction. Uh -huh. So the best thing that ever happened to him was what was called the Hickory House, was the name of that the little the joint, restaurant. The it was a joint. joint, it was a barbecue joint. Uh -huh. And it, it was a springboard for him because my father just let him start cooking. He would cook the ribs and he would do everything. And then I had to even do French fries. I would have to chop it up. And I was doing everything, all the junk work. You know, I was doing the little stuff and he was doing the big stuff. Uh, okay. So, but it, only once did I ask my father about ribs because they were very proud of whatever their sauce was. I hated ribs. In fact, I can't tell you how many nights I came home from basketball or baseball practice and my mother would just leave ribs in the oven on low because she didn't cook and so it'd be like mm -hmm. I would have what, what came from the Hickory House. And so I grew up on ribs and I never liked them particularly, but. At one point, he was taking me home one night and he was pretty drunk because he, he would get a big vodka and Coke to take home. I don't know how we didn't have a wreck, but we didn't. And there were no seat belts worn at this time, but that was how crazy my father was. Right, so he had like no judgment at all, it sounds like. No judgment, like. no. And what, the, was he mean to you also? He, he just wanted me badly to fail because he knew I was smarter than he was from the start. And, he, and I, was, I was a good athlete, always coming up, especially up through 14 or 15, I was often the best athlete. And he had nothing to do with it, he never came. He, he put me down, he just, he told me I would never, he, he wanted me to be an auto mechanic. He said, you need to learn to work on cars because th you can make some money doing that. They're, they're always, uh, there'll be always be a need for mechanics. And I'm like, I'm, I have no interest. I like to drive cars and fast cars, but I didn't want to work on cars. And so we clashed over that. And then we ended when I was 16 at the restaurant. It's not even a restaurant, it was a joint. He would cater parties occasionally in a giant sort of van. It was. It's kind of this beat up, run down old van, and it, you could walk in the back of it. So I was ha I was forced to work, and it was in the summertime. And he, we we had cookers of ribs that had plastic handles on the side, but the tops were were metal, and it, they were hot, hot like burn your hand hot. So. I'm up in the van and he's supposed to hand the cookers to me and he started th throwing the cooker where I had to try to catch the handles. And he was just dumb drunk by that. I mean, he was functional, but, but he was just completely off. So he did, when he threw the first one, I said, don't do that again. And of course he tried it again and he threw it to me and I just, I caught it and I put it down and I got out and we're out in the parking lot where people can see. And he says, what do you think you're gonna do about it? And, and I said, well, you're just not gonna do that again. He said, what are you gonna do, whip my ass? And I said, if you want, I'm right here. And he came at me and threw a big roundhouse punch and I just decked him one time, one shot and knocked him back. It was easy, <laughs> there was no contest. And he said, 
I'll never forget. Go home to your mother. And I said, thank you very much. I'm out and I never went back. So at least I got out of having to work in the summers at the Hickory House. So that was the end of that. And how did your relationship change after that? Or did it? I never spoke to him again. He, that was the last time you mm -hmm. talked to him? I never spoke to him. So how did you deal with that after? I mean, it's you, you were dealing with it on the surface, mm -hmm. but it was still inside of you. So I just knew that I had to get out and my only way out was somehow through school and maybe sports. So they always say the children of alcoholics can overachieve. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know it at the time, but remember I'm the oldest, so I'm having to figure this out on the fly because nobody's, I don't, I don't have a big brother and I don't have a, either parent to guide or counsel. Mm -hmm. Did the three of you come together at all, or did you kind of each just fend for yourself to survival mode? They bonded, which I never quite understood, but I tried to be close to my sister, but she loved him, which is cool by me, and they just sort of stayed together because I, I pretty soon left them behind to have to deal with the mess, which is, I just couldn't help it. I, I was able to, thanks to the journalism teacher at my high school, I had like an act of God where I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I took an advanced English class. I was always smart. I don't know where I got it from because I, I don't really see it in them, but whatever. It could just, be there, but it was just it was dormant buried. because, yeah. yeah. Okay, maybe. Or buried, right, maybe. because of the alcohol. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know. I never you don't really think saw so. it. Did you I have a know. did you have like a grandparent or anybody no. who you mm -mm. did you have any like older relatives mm -mm. or extended family? No, I they were there, but th that they weren't there for me. So nobody was there for you, mm -mm. even your extended. I was flying solo. I looked around at where I was and I said, "I'm free. I'm, I'm I got my ticket out," and so I. I did, I had to call my girlfriend and I said, I'm your, and the irony is she, she wound up coming to Vanderbilt. She went to Vanderbilt a year after me. Interesting. We did get married. It was a bad idea because we were sort of brother and sister by then, but I was still close with her and she's great. And, but the point was I picked up and left and I left my brother and sister in a bit of a mess. I did. They weren't as able to cope maybe with it and my mother just fell completely apart at that point. So they were sort of left with the ruins of the house. And so it made them closer and me more sort of estranged from that. But Did you stop talking to them at that no, point completely? No, so you've kept in touch. I have, but just never had a connection with my brother. I can't tell you how different we are. And it's almost like, how did we come out of the same womb? So like, how, how are different? Happen? Like so, how are you different? Different how? I mean, not just your interest in sports versus cooking. And that's the key. That's the um, key. Yes. Thing? Yes, because there's no common language. You know, there's no. But there's a common crisis you went through. Yeah, we did do that. that. I don't know. I can't explain it. You're asking a really good question that I don't have a very good answer for. You I don't just have to have an answer for it. I didn't just, have a it connection. Is interesting. We just went our separate ways, and I love him, and I. I mean, we shared a bunk bed all the way to, let's see, when did we get our own rooms? We, we had to add on a room. Um, and I finally got my own. I guess I was eighth, ninth, ninth grade. I'll say ninth grade. Yeah. So, so my point is I slept on the top bunk and he slept on the bottom bunk for the first, let's see, ninth grade, you'd be 14 to 50, say 14, yeah. 14 years. Yeah. Uh, well, he was two years later than me, but so that's but you 12 weren't years. close even all those years. You're saying even mm -hmm. one bunk bed or one, one mm -hmm. bed away from each other. Mm -hmm. we're you never were never close. close. I don't know why. It's just so, he was so different from me. He was the flip side of me. He wasn't competitive like I am. He wasn't um, obsessed with, with being an athlete the way I was just obsessed. I was, and I was really good up through eighth grade. Speaking of McGinnis High School, they had a 
basketball camp at McGinnis. I arrived that that high school had a played a real powerful sort of turning point in my life. But there was a basketball camp for kids from all over Texas and Oklahoma that was famous that they had every summer. And when I was 14, after my eighth grade year, I won most valuable player at the camp. And it was a big deal. And there was a story about it in the paper the next day that I still have. And I grew fast Mm. and I was physical and very competitive for my size. And then by 16, 17, everybody grew above me. So I just got my growth fast. So, so all that's counter to everything. My brother, he was just different. He was very creative, but artsy creative. And I was school, I I was writing creative. You're very intellectual. Yes, but he was, he liked to, um, you know, um, do ceramics. You make ceramics. He liked to paint. Um, he, I think for a while he was making some of his own clothes. So he liked to do all the arty stuff. And in school, he, he was in thespians and I don't think he was in the band, but he played the piano. I don't remember. We, we were told different social groups. So I don't know. You just were never, right? It was just mm-hmm. never. No. And then what happened after? And then he started to have his own path of success. Mm-hmm. Like, was it parallel to yours or? And like, how did you, were you in touch at that point? We kept in touch, but mostly through like Christmas birthday kind of things. Uh-huh. But he had a hard time with my mother. I don't even know what happened because I wasn't there. It was terrible. But he didn't talk to you about it or your sister no. didn't talk Mm-mm. to you about it? No, because she, just knew my it was mother bad. just crashed and burned it. They took her, thank them for both of this. They took her to AA, to Alcoholics Anonymous. and. It saved her. It clicked. It did. Yes. So she, she was went. The one. And she, she went when I was invested. in college. I was away. Well, maybe I was a sophomore. She remarried a guy who's another bad guy, and it was just a disaster. And then I came home, and she was such a wreck for when I came home for Christmas, and it was probably my junior year. Then um, they finally said, "You're going to die." She had a bad car wreck, drunk driving drunk. Um, was in the hospital for a while. I don't even know anything about it because I was gone to mm. school. And in those days, it was once you went away, we didn't have cell phones, so it's harder to stay connected. Yeah, totally different. Very different. Yeah. It's like writing letters, you know, yeah. like snail mail letters. Or like long distance you, phone call. Yeah, which I didn't do because I didn't have any money. So um, it is, it's impossible to stay in touch. I only saw my mother when I went home for Christmas or summer. So in the end they took her by the hand and led her to AA I think it's my junior year and from that moment on she never missed a meeting the rest of her born days she went every Monday night and she would always tell me I can't make it without the meeting and she lived a pretty good life and then I did get my athletic ability from her. She was a really good athlete. And so at 50 years of age, she took up golf and immediately within a year, she became the club champion. She won mm-hmm. it like, I don't know, 10 times over the next 15 years. So what happened after she died in terms of your thoughts about everything, your relationship with mm. Rick and your sister and all of it was there a shift for you we all went back for the memorial we had a memorial service for um i don't know that's another good question if i'm being completely candid when i can't remember i think my brother's wife called me to say she passed and i was talking to her every day but i did not go back i just couldn't face it to be honest with you, but I knew she wasn't going to make it because I kept talking to the doctor, a uh, woman who would tell me her kidneys shot and she's just, it's a matter of hours now. And I talked to her one last time and she was incoherent. And then when Rick's wife named Deanne called me, I think she texted me, she's gone. You know, I cried because it got me because of all we went through, but it's hard to have love for her when she had very little for me because I was unloved. 
So I, the, the bottom line is I, I actually loved my childhood in many ways because it, it brought me here and it toughened me for this. I'm tough. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a survivor. So that's what I kept surviving yeah. until I thrived. So I, I, I have no regrets about it. And I don't regret telling you I have nothing for my mother. She didn't give me much. What do you have for Rick? What would you, what do you hope? Do you still talk to him? At, not regularly, but every once in a while on occasions, you know, for, for an occasion or something. Uh, we had a great talk at our, at that memorial service for my mom. That was great. I love him. I, I root for him. And every time I pray, I always pray for him. I pray that he doesn't work too hard because I think he's like me. He's got that overachiever gene in him. And I'm thankful for all that he's done because he has done a lot. He got all, He's won the James Beard Award twice for best restaurant and best chef. And my mother told me this. He didn't tell me, but we're going all the way back to early Obama days, the one, he's got several restaurants in Chicago, but the one called Topo La Bampo is, that's what my mom told me, was, or is Obama's favorite restaurant. And it's the one you have to have reservations six months in advance because it's chef's choice where he cooks a lot and you get served, you, you don't mm -hmm. order, you just get served. So I don't even know much about this, but but Obama does because he loves it. So, and by the way, Obama asked my brother to be the White House chef in his first term. And from, I, again, I get got this from my mother, but we did learn growing up, you cannot be an absentee restaurateur. It, it's, it, it will run over the cliff because people will steal from you and they'll, they, they won't have your standards. So you, you can't go away and think that your restaurants are going to survive because they won't. So he couldn't go because he had too many responsibilities in Chicago. But that's, my little brother got asked to be the White House chef. That's pretty great. So you're proud of him. I'm extremely proud of him because I know better than anybody what he came from because I know what I came from. Okay, and my final question, at mm -hmm. least for this talk, because okay. there'll be another, I hope, All right. um, is who is the real Skip Bayless?